is ever expanding with wide varieties of materials available for us to use. However, the choice of the dental materials to a large extent determines the outcome of your clinical practice. Moreover, with extensive research in nanomaterials and incorporated dental materials has further widened our niche. So, to explore further into the advancement in nanomaterials and antibacterial polymers, do join us for a webinar on 26th May at 3 p.m. organized by Special Interest Group Quality and Safe Use of Dental Materials. Let us collaborate together to join our hands and move ahead for a better tomorrow. Uh, good afternoon, one and all have gathered here for today's webinar. I wholeheartedly welcome all the participants uh, for today's webinar, which is organized by the special interest group, Quality and Safe Use of Dental Materials. Uh, before we go ahead with our presentation by our first speaker, Professor Bairappa, I just want to uh, brief the participants about the special interest group. This particular SIG was constituted in 2011 under the able guidance of uh, Dr. Nandlan. After that, uh, Dr. Dakshani Ma'am had taken over as the group leader. And now with the guidance of Ravindra sir, we are moving ahead uh, with this particular SIG. This SIG has been uh, reconstituted recently because we felt that uh, uh, the dentistry is no more limited only to a dental discipline. We have grown beyond, wherein uh, always there is an emphasis on interdisciplinary or a multidisciplinary approach. And uh, uh, there has been experts from other fields who have been constantly supporting us for our end years. So uh, we reconstituted this group recently with uh, these being our uh, members of our SIG. Professor Bairappa sir, who is the speaker for today, is also our uh, member. Plus, we have certain other external members also. So it is a complete uh, vast group of uh, members with uh, expertise of different levels. Now, I would want to share what is the objective of this SIG, why this SIG was formulated. Uh, this uh, SIG is formulated with, as I told initially, with an intention towards focusing and working in a particular field. So for that, it is essential that first we upgrade our knowledge. So as this webinar is a part of that series itself, wherein we are trying to upgrade our, ourselves constantly. As we know that learning is a continuous phenomenon, we are upgrading ourselves continuously and webinar and uh, CD programs are one such uh, aims or objectives that we would constantly conduct through this particular SIG. Apart from that, we conduct research activities to enhance our clinical experience, to enhance the clinical experience of the patients. So who can work in this? It is not only that only the members of this SIG can work. Anybody who is interested or who is constantly working in this field of dental materials are free enough to come and collaborate with this particular group and conduct their research work. There is going to be certain amount of uh, uh, assistance from the university also. And uh, I thank the Academy of Higher Education for uh, supporting us for all these end of years. So it is not only restricted to these group of people. So anybody who is working constantly with dental materials and would want to, want to further enhance their research activities can join this group. As a part of this group, we have already conducted various research activities some of which have been self-funded, some of which have been funded by JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research. And uh, uh, also we have converted all these uh, research activities, what we have conducted into various publications. We have also done certain collaborative work. Uh, uh, initially, we tried to prepare uh, the, the good aspects of the research. Uh, what I would want to share is we had prepared for our studies uh, the artificial mouth and artificial saliva. So what is the importance of artificial mouth, especially in the current pandemic scenarios when clinical trials may be a little difficult to conduct. So in such cases, the trial of the dental materials can be very easily conducted with the use of these artificial mouth because it gives a close simulation to the oral cavity. 
since we had controlled flow of saliva, controlled flow of demineralizing agents, or any remineralizing solutions, or whatever products that we are trying to test, we can use with the use of, uh, we can perform the studies with the use of this artificial mouth. So that was one of the interesting outcome of this particular SIG. Apart from that, we had uh, gone ahead and done certain collaborative activities also. Uh, JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research had signed MOU with IFGA. This was when Dr. Nanlal sir was the group leader. And then recently we have signed in the MOU with the uh, Trifest Pharmaceuticals who are constantly working with uh, probiotics. So we are trying to work uh, extensively with the application of probiotics into dentistry. And based on this, we have already conducted a lot of research, which is collaborative, and most of it have got converted into publications. And also, it is into patent application. A few of the products are in patent application in the pipeline. Apart from this, we had conducted previously certain other uh, professional upgradation programs, uh, which was by Dr. Santosh And last year, recently, we had conducted again a webinar series by a group of various eminent speakers. So this uh, would just give you a brief idea about what this particular SIG is and what we are trying to focus on as we are going ahead. So with this brief introduction about uh, the special interest group on quality and safe use of dental materials, I would now request Dr. Indira to kindly go ahead with the next part of the session. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Sima. Good afternoon, one and all. Myself, Dr. Indira from the Department of Pediatric and Preventive Dentistry, welcome you all to this webinar on fostering research with dental materials, organized by SIG, quality and safe use of dental materials. Nanotechnology is used widely in various day-to-day -day activities, including in the field of medicine as well as dentistry. The nanomaterials has strengthened the modern, in the modern dentistry immensely and current, currently driving the dental material industry to a substantial growth. The advent of nanotechnology in dentistry have answers to the mysterious or problems associated with the conventional materials, as they have the tendency to mimic the surface and interface properties of natural tissues. Nanodentistry is still considered as an emerging field with the huge potential to yield new innovative generations of technologically advanced biomaterials in the field of prosthodontics, orthodontics, periodontics, and restorative dental sciences. It is expected that the nanodentistry will eventually give rise to a highly efficient, effective, and personalized dental treatment. Friends, to conceptualize this, con uh, this thought, today we have an eminent speaker, Professor Dr. Bhairapa Sir, Sir, who is a co-chancellor in Adi Chanchangiri University. He is a renowned academician and a researcher. He has more than 490 publications in peer-reviewed international journals with over 9,500 citations and has received various national and international awards for his research activities. Today, Professor Bhairapa Sir will be enlightening us on emerging trends in advanced nanomaterials for dentistry. We welcome you, sir, for this seminar. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hindira, for the nice introduction. Am I audible to all of you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, before I start my talk, I would like to seek the divine blessings of uh, Jagat Guru Sri 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 Shivaratri Desikendra Mahaswamiji on this occasion. And also, I would like to Thank the organizers and the patrons, like Dr. Suresh Bolgeraj, Dr. Surinder Singh, the Pro Chancellor and Vice Chancellors, respectively, followed by Dr. Manjunatha Registra, Dr. Kushalapa, Director, Dr. Ravindra, the Principal of this uh, dental college and hospital, and also all the members of. Uh, SIG group for inviting me to this wonderful program on uh, fostering research with uh, dental materials. 
straight away, I would like to go to my presentation and share the screen. Yeah, can you see the screen clearly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's visible, you know, clear. Yes, sir. It's visible. Yes. Okay. Visible, sir. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to speak on the emerging trends in advanced nanomaterials processing for dentistry. And the outline of my talk would cover introduction on these advanced nanomaterials and advanced nanobiomaterials in dentistry, the types of these nanomaterials are commonly used and the commonly adopted processing methods or techniques, characterization and applications of these advanced nanomaterials, and finally, summary. Uh, in this view graph, I'm going to show you the weight distribution of constituents of cortical bone to illustrate the cell proteins proportion in organic materials. If you take the whole cortical bone, you have about 60% inorganic composition, that is uh, calcium phosphate. And we have water about 18%, that is why we call hydroxyapatite. But uh, in the hydroxyapatite, what is missing is this 22% organic. And what is this 22% organic is made up of? And if you expand this to 100%, you have about 90% collagen and about 10% non-collagen material. And further, if you expand this 10% non-collagen material, you have about 84% extracellular material and about 16% cell protein present in the cortical bone. So this is uh, how the distribution of various components in the whole cortical bone. I would like to show you this uh, slide giving the inorganic compounds, how they are distributed in, the, in various organisms and constituting what different parts of these organisms. To start with uh, a very common inorganic material present in most of the organism, that is silica. Maybe in the form of opal, that is uh, a kind of uh, crypto-crystalline variety of silica. It is neither completely amorphous nor completely crystalline. So that is the status of silica or opal we call. And this is commonly present in diatoms, radiolaria, and so many plants. And here I show you an example, a picture of pampas grass leaf. And the grass leaf has a very sharp edge, and that edge can cut your skin if you are not very careful while cutting the grass. This is the reason why most of us, while cutting the grass, we scratch or cut our skin because it has a silica nano blade or nano scale thin film of very hard silica in the form of a sharp blade. So that is why we say while cutting the grass, we have to be very careful. The edges of the grass leaves are very sharp. Then iron oxides. We find iron oxides in bacteria, tuna, fish, salmon fish, chitons, limpets, beavers, fish, and so on. And iron oxide forms in these uh, organisms, it works like uh, sensors, teeth, teeth surfaces, sclerites. 
Look at this picture, a gastropod having iron sulfide. And this gastropod has a kind of armor present to protect itself from the invaders. It's a very sharp armor in gastropod. So this is how the nature is, uh, you know, creating various species and giving various organic and inorganic components distributed. And then coming to calcium carbonates, it can be present extensively in most of the sea animals, gastropod, mollusk, then corals, then also in coccolids and so on. And that forms shells, then cell walls, and scales in the cell walls, and even eggs, shells, all these things you can expect from calcium carbonate. And calcium phosphate, and in fact, these calcium phosphates are especially very interesting for today's meeting. Calcium phosphates you find extensively in fish, vertebrates, mammals, chiton, jellyfish, sorry, in chitons, forming scales, bones, teeth. And then we have calcium sulfate, for example, in jellyfish, it forms a kind of gravity receptor. And barium sulfates, you find in loxotes, xenophyophora, and so on. And even uh, strontium sulfate can form skeletons. So almost 100 mineral species like this, what is listed in row, I mean, column two, are found. I have just listed about uh, a few selected ones, but you have around 100 such inorganic species or components present in various uh, uh, bodies. Now, coming to straight away coming to the nanotechnology in dentistry, you can use nanomaterials in antimicrobial and therapeutic applications, even in reinforcement. And for the reinforcement, use nanoparticles of hydroxyapatite, you can have a kind of adhesive dentistry. And nano zirconia as bioceramics and for implantation, nano zirconia is one of the popular materials. Then nano silica also, particularly in endodontics and biomineralization. Then we have uh, even in the uh, uh, even uh, nano carbon we have and uh, reinforcement nanoparticles, uh, nano carbon nanoparticles are particles are commonly used in uh, prosthodontics and biomineralization. We have uh, therapeutic applications like solid lipid, periodontology, then hydrogel, gain in periodontology and dendromers, biomineralization. Then we have a variety of uh, nanoparticles being used in antimicrobial applications like chitosan, copper-based nanoparticles, zinc-based, I'm going to speak on this, zinc oxide, then ACP, this is amorphous calcium phosphate, and titanium oxide, and silver nanoparticles. So these are the commonly used nanoparticles in dentistry. Now, how we use this nanoparticles, a variety of nanoparticles in dentistry, or on the whole in various biomedical applications. And these nanoparticles are used as normally as carriers of drugs or biomolecules. And dendromites are used, metals are used, core shell structures are created, liposomes are also used, coated around the nanoparticles then nanofilms are coated, then silica coated, then polymeric particles are conjugated, then 
missile or missile is also polymeric missile is also conjugated then pure missiles are also conjugated with the required nano particles and nano fibers are also used now let us see what all the common materials used in dentistry the conventional materials all of you are very familiar amalgam is the most common one used even today then glass enamel gold composites ceramics a variety of ceramics zirconia maybe and steel bone filling products and teeth bleaching products so these images are all shown here these icons and if you take the nano particles based applications in dentistry you have the carbon based nano materials hydroxyapatite nano materials these rounded ones then we have iron oxide also commonly used in a variety of applications in dentistry then zirconia silica silver also silver nano particles and titanium oxide nano particles these are the commonly used nano particles in various applications of dentistry now i am going to focus mainly on hydroxyapatite as a bioceramic followed by zinc oxide very briefly all of you know hydroxyapatite is nothing but calcium phosphate hydrous calcium phosphate the general formula is this and the stoichiometric ratio of calcium to phosphorus is 1.67 1.67 is the stoichiometry of ca2p and hydroxyapatite nanoparticles are the building blocks of the hardest tissue of our body that is bones and teeth hydroxyapatite is highly biocompatible antibacterial bioactive toward bone regeneration and it is the best material best choice for the fabrication of porous and dense bioceramics the work on hydroxyapatite began somewhere in late 1980s and it went to the peak during mid 1990s and till today a lot of groups worldwide working on the processing of um, hydroxyapatite bioceramic not just as a pure hydroxyapatite but uh, it is uh, uh, doped and also uh, modified with so many components maybe biological or organic components to make it more application oriented and it also serves as a most promising coating material for titanium in human implantations and dental fixtures and it prevents bacterial addition this is the greatest advantage of uh, hydroxyapatite and i was working on uh, the pre uh, preparation of hydrothermal processing of this hydroxyapatite for johnson and johnson company in us uh, they were making the bone replacement materials using this hydroxyapatite prepared by us you can modify the hydroxyapatite and also you can load with a desired drug and it is the best choice for osteomyelitis and the biggest you know disadvantage with hydroxyapatite is the low mechanical reliability and it does not allow for heavy load bearing applications especially in the aqueous environment that is the reason why a lot of work is going on to modify the hydroxyapatite to, to make it more uh, reliable for the for its modulus properties it is uh, as i said earlier it is used as uh, one of the most common re reinforcement in composites 
coatings on metal implants and granular fill for direct incorporation into human tissue. This is how even while we go in for the 3D printing of uh, the bones, uh, replica or whatever it is, we use this particularly. And HAP nanoparticles are the building blocks and the biocompatibility and bone-like composition of nano hydroxyapatite densis have used a bone graft material based on nano particles of hydroxyapatite and beta TCP that is tricalcium phosphate for the implantation purpose. Modification of hydroxyapatite for biological applications is most important. I started with, that was a challenging work when I started working on uh, the processing of um, hydroxyapatite. And uh, Johnson & Johnson was very particular about uh, the size uh, distribution and also the morphology control. So we started with uh, modeling work, thermochemical computation we did. And also to get a pure 100% hydroxyapatite in the final product without any SCP or TCP or other calcium species present in the hydroxyapatite final product. So we used a variety of chelating agents like cit citric acid, EDTA, and even some proteins and fatty organic acids. There are so many and biomolecules, actually Dr. Shuba and other members in our group, they started using the biomolecules. And in fact, the fatty organic acids were extensively used by us, by the earlier research students. And we have reviewed all these, you know, about the surface modification and how to choose an effective modifier, all that I have reviewed in one of our review articles published in 2012 in Progress in Crystal Growth and Characterization of Materials. Also, the modifiers can be the compounds capable of ring opening polymerization, hydrophobic silicon containing molecules. And what is most important in modification is this facilitates control of morphology, size, and surface chemistry. I can alter the surface charge of the nanoparticles of hydroxyapatite. I can also change the surface to volume ratio. I can change the porosity and so many other physical chemical characteristics of hydroxy, hydroxyapatite can be modified, can be altered by using an appropriate modifier. But uh, what is uh, most important is, uh, what is the best modifier is not yet clear till today, or particularly for the hydroxy appetite. Here, I have listed out uh, a variety of uh, calcium phosphates, uh, like uh, monocalcium phosphate to monohydrate, monocalcium phosphate anhydrous, dicalcium phosphate dihydrate, then that is also called brucite mineral. Then dicalcium phosphate anhydrous monotite, a very popular species, brucite and monotite both. Then we have octacalcium phosphate, alpha tricalcium phosphate, that is alpha TCP, beta TCP. Then we have amorphous calcium phosphate like ACP. So like this, we have a variety of phosphate, but the most important one, what I'm going to cover here is this 1.67 stoichiometric ratio of calcium to phosphor, that is hydroxyapatite. When water is present, when fluorine is present, it is fluorapatite. When excess oxygen is present, it is oxyapatite. Then they're all mentioned this way, HAHAP or OHAP or FA or FAP. Then we have tetracalcium phosphate that is uh, a mineral called Hilgenstockite uh, tetracalcium phosphate. And this is the chemical formula of uh, each one of these uh, calcium. 
phosphates but not all are useful in the dental dentistry or even in biomedical uh, other biomedical applications most of the time when you synthesize uh, the pure when you want to synthesize pure hydroxy apatite you end up always with uh, the presence of some amount of this monotite or brucite or even tricalcium phosphate and most common one is acp and maybe other calcium species so we have spent a lot of time to get to a pure species of hydroxy apatite i am going to tell how we could succeed in getting pure hap there are different processes processing methods on the whole for advanced bio ceramics advanced nano bio ceramics maybe the wet chemistry roots or you can even call it as solution chemistry that includes what i am going to cover today the techniques like hydrothermal solvothermal and supercritical fluid technology then solid state reactions most of the earliest works on hydroxy apatite on and other calcium phosphate synthesis began with these solid state reactions people use even sputtering sol gel technique mechanochemical microwave technique laser ablation technique electrochemical or electro deposition biological or biomimetic technique is used popularly these days then colloidal chemistry approach then flame pyrolysis and the most popular in the current scenario is the 3d printing technology wherein we can use bioprinting method or fused deposition method or polyjet printing or selective laser sintering and stereolithography printing and in fact our group at the hadi chenchenigiri university is working on this 3d printing techniques for various biomedical devices and also the other popularly used technique is the chemical precipitation or it can be even deep solution technique and so on the advantages of 3d printing are listed here it is very easy to fabricate and that cuts uh, uh, that reduces uh, the fabrication time required and also it is a very cost effective technique you don't need much uh, you know human resource or manpower and less wastage and um, unlike uh, you know other milling techniques or other uh, solution methods and no need to prepare in advance as they can be stored digitally and reproduced on demand whenever you want and it's becoming very popular not just for the dentistry even in uh, uh, fashion designing it is becoming very popular to make shoes branded shoes exactly fitting into your feet most of the sports persons they use nowadays uh, the 3d printed uh, graphene oxide based uh, rubber based uh, shoes uh, which are very light but at the same time super hard uh, materials very light weight and uh, also they are made to fit into your feet exactly by 3d printing then hollow objects can be created with greater ease and no other technique can uh, be you know used for this kind of thing other than 3d printing then possible to print complex shapes and structures again the other regular conventional molding and casting will not give you this kind of um, complex shapes perfectly then less stresses induced introduced in the object in the final product you don't find any cracks or other mechanical defects then you can have rapid prototyping and possibility of using multiple materials in a single object this is the beauty of this 3d printing now i give you here a picture of uh, bio printing wherein uh, you know it is nothing but an amalgamation of engineering and cell biology put together 
So this is what, uh, you know, you find in bioprinting, very popular nowadays, and it enables artificial construction of living tissues and organs in three dimension. And coming to the 3D printing applications in dentistry, 3D printing you can use in orthodontics, you can use in endodontics and periodontics, you can use in oral and uh, maxillofacial surgery and uh, prosthodontics uh, applications. So 3D printing has a special mention today uh, in the current uh, scenario in the dentistry. Now, let me talk about uh, the processing of some of the selected uh, advanced in bio, nano bio materials for dentistry. And uh, I have selected here hydroxypatite and uh, zinc oxide. Here I'm going to give a very brief tutorial about the hydrothermal technique. It is nothing but uh, crystallization from solution and that too from the superheated solution. It's very useful for materials with very low solubility and ultra high melting points, maybe even diamond or corundum or ruby, very high melting compounds. They can be crystallized using this hydrothermal technique at much reduced temperature. And how to define this hydrothermal? And for most of you, it looks like um, a very new terminology, very new, but uh, in our kitchen day to day, we use the hydrothermal technique to prepare food, to cook rice or to boil dal rice and so many, you know, even to cook sambar and curry. It is nothing but any heterogeneous or homogeneous chemical reaction in the presence of aqueous, maybe alkaline solutions or acidic solutions or non-aqueous solvents, maybe some organic solvents like alcohol or glycol-based solvents. Or you can use, you know, these are, these are also called mineralizers. And you can also use some biomolecules under high pressure and high temperature. High pressure means pressure higher than one atmosphere and temperature higher than the room temperature to dissolve and recrystallize materials that are relatively soluble under ordinary conditions in a closed system. This is a kitchen pressure cooker. And this is a laboratory hydrothermal lab, uh, you know, pressure cooker, you can say, we call hydrothermal autoclave. Even in the hospitals, we commonly use the autoclaves where the same pressure cooker principle is used to create high pressure and high temperature to sterilize. The same principle is used. The only you know, thing, the difference between the two is when the pressure is very high, it is released. The weight kept here will pop up and releases the pressure and the weight then will go down. See, what is, why, why do we need a pressure cooker? You can cook, you know, rice or dal in an ordinary open vessel, but uh, that is not only cumbersome, it takes a lot of time, one hour to boil dal. And also it overflows. It will, uh, you know, uh, make uh, the stove dirty and uh, more energy consuming. But coming to the pressure cooker based, uh, you know, dal uh, boiling, it takes uh, not more than 15 minutes. And also, you know, it is because since the reaction take place in a closed system, the reaction kinetics are very high. The pressure contributes in the reaction kinetics in boiling the dal. So that is the same principle used in the in organic chemistry lab also. So here I have shown different solvents like aqueous solvents, non-aqueous solvents, you can also use biological solvents and you can call biohydrothermal. So the aqueous solvents are listed here, maybe acidic or alkaline and non-aqueous solvents like organic solvents such as methanol, diethylene glycol, butyl alcohol, diphenyl ether and so on. And nowadays 
organics are added into any of these uh, some organics are added molecules and even bio molecules are added no when i say organic it is nothing but the fatty organic acids that is the modifier or the surfactant the same thing with bioactive molecules maybe the phytochemicals or photo <coughs> plant extracts so they also act as surfactants they can be used for the purpose of controlling the particle size and to prevent the agglomeration to enhance the reaction kinetics in fact what materials we could prepare in 10 days or 8 days we could prepare in just a few hours or even few minutes and if you go to the super critical hydrothermal technique the same hydroxy apatite can be created within a few seconds with desired surface chemistry desired surface area and also desired surface charge and particle size absolutely no agglomeration all these even the morphology you can give the biggest challenge in hydroxy apatite synthesis is the growth of long needles the growth of hydroxy apatite along the c axis now the current trend in hydrothermal processing processing of the materials shown here see these are the inorganic compounds high melting compounds i have selected and earlier workers researchers use such high temperature high pressure and including the diamond you see more than 1000 degrees centigrade and very high pressure like 10000 bars the same compounds we synthesized in our laboratory at such mild temperature and pressure conditions that is why hydrothermal is becoming very attractive and environmentally benign and less ener energy consuming and especially when you add the biological molecules biosurfactants or the plant extracts into the system that makes it very friendly for the processing of bio materials for biological applications and the advantage of hydrothermal technique is shown here if you take the raw materials which are amorphous less crystalline and not dense using the conventional firing or sintering or solid state reactions you can get irregular particles maybe less dense less crystalline and you cannot have any control over the crystallinity or the morphology or the density but when you come to the uh, hydrothermal technique because of the highly controlled diffusion you can get such beautiful particles any desired shape you can give any desired uh size you can give and also any desired surface chemistry you can introduce to these nanoparticles that is the beauty or advantage of hydrothermal technique so i mentioned about the modification surface modification this surface modification has come from the kitchen experience again so while boiling the noodles we always add a few drops of oil into the spaghetti or noodles you know when you take these noodles or spaghetti for boiling in the water we add a few drops of oil so that you can pull out each and every uh, spaghetti or the noodles because a very thin layer of this organic molecules that is the oil content will be coated along the uh, surface of all along the surface of this uh, noodle so that is why each and every noodle you can separately pick up but if you do not add the oil then all these noodles will become sticky so in the same way here in the nanoparticles processing using the hydrothermal technology we use some surfactant maybe fatty organic acid or maybe some biological molecules when you add this biological or fatty organic acid under room temperature conditions you have the starting raw material of metal or metal oxides and the solvent may be water or organic some solvent and here you have the fatty organic acid or the bio surfactant so 
the biosurfactant is always in the top. Just like when you add a few drops of oil to the water for boiling the noodles, the oil will be at the top exactly in the same way. The same philosophy was used here to prepare beautiful nanoparticles. During the hydrothermal reaction, it undergoes homogenization. You find maybe hydrolysis process or dehydration processes occurring. And all around these metals or metal oxides, you have a very thin coating of the organics. Now, these metal ions would, would you know, come to the, this level, this part in the upper portion where you have the organics or biosurfactant. And the metals are coated with this surfactant. And at the bottom, as usual, you have the solvent phase, solvent phase. So this is a wonderful ex example taken from the kitchen experience. Now you see here in this wave graph how the fatty acid surfactant added nanoparticles look every particle you can separate out. But here, when you do not add any surfactant, you get such agglomerated, coagulated nanoparticles. So in the recent years, there is a trend to add microwave energy or sonar energy or mechanochemical energy or a simple stirring of the reactor or electrochemical energy or the current magnetic field or biological molecules. When you add, along with this hydrothermal, conventional hydrothermal, you get you know, a multi-energy processing conditions and that is going to be the future of materials, advanced materials processing, especially for nanomaterials. And the reaction kinetics are so high and you can expect a chemistry at the speed of light in seconds or a fraction of a second, you can crystallize the nanoparticles with desired shape, size and the surface chemistry. And with this concept, you can even think of instant hydrothermal vending machine, nano vending machine. You just drop the coin and you get the nanoparticles, required nanoparticles instantly. That picture I didn't show here anyway. And these are the commonly popularly used autoclaves hydrothermal reactors in the synthesis of nanoparticles. These are the simple more autoclaves, these are the stirred autoclaves wherein you can stir the autoclaves. Here you cannot stir, you can't even see the pressure inside. You have to just calculate using the PVT relation. And here in the stirred reactor, you can measure the pressure using this Bordon gauge. You can even pump in the required solvent or the gas inside the reactor, or you can even pull out what is going on in the middle of the reaction and subject to Raman analysis, laser Raman spectroscopy and see what different phases are formed. And these are the high temperature pressure autoclaves. Okay, these are the valves to control the pressure. And these are called popularly called Tuttle Roy autoclaves, which can withstand about 800 degrees C and up to about 10 kilobars pressure, very high temperature, very high pressure. And what we did in preparing pure, 100% pure hydroxypatite like this is uh, the stability field or the calculated phase diagrams we prepared in advance using the thermochemical computation, modeling technique, thermochemical modeling, using the raw materials, its differentiation concentrations, uh, constants, or uh, coefficient. Uh, uh, you know, a diff, uh, diffusion coefficient and the free energy, enthalpy, entropy, and so many other such values, thermodynamic parameters were employed to, uh, you know, use, I mean, employed in the modeling, thermodynamic modeling. So this diagram shows um, this uh, calcium phosphate uh, hydroxypatite synthesis from this system. Okay, what all the other species you get is shown here. This is at 25 degrees centigrade. You can prepare keeping this 1.67 uh, stoichiometry and pressure 0.1 megapascals. You can get this uh, 
hydroxypatite fuel phase. And here you get both the mixture of um, monotide phase and hydroxypatite phase, and you get um, the pure monotide phase. And here coming to uh, the higher pressure, uh, uh, pressure 2.5 megapascals and uh, high temperature like 200 degree centigrade, keeping the same. Uh, now we have kept the pressure, uh, I mean, sorry, this uh, calcium phosphorus ratio at 1.24. Okay, we get completely a slightly a different uh, diagram, phase diagram, and you get the pure uh, hydroxypatite here, and you have monotite and hydroxypatite, much broader field, and you have the monotite. So such diagrams help us, uh, particularly in uh, you know while you are using very expensive chemicals, so that uh, whatever the raw material you take, everything will be converted to the product you are expecting. For 99.9% .9 of the raw material taken will be converted to the same amount. Uh, I mean, uh, to the final product, uh, and the wastage will be maybe 0.1% if you if your thermodynamic computation is very good. So coming here is the flow chart showing how the phosphorus solution and cal uh, calcium solutions are mixed in this ratio, psychometry 1.67 at the rate of uh, three uh, milliliters per minute at room temperature and then uh, maintain, you know, at uh, pH 10, you get a kind of ACP that is amorphous calcium phosphate. Then subject to the hydrothermal treatment without stirring and here with the stirring. Two different types, two different conditions. Here you get the extra kinetic energy and here no additional kinetic energy. You get the particles like this, more, more coagulated. And here when you have the additional this, a stirring, you get much better particles. This is how the uh, you know chemistry works. The multi-energy hydrothermal you can call because of the stirring, and these particles were subjected to various analysis, uh, characterization studies like this. And I'm going to quickly glance through, uh, show you some of the wave graphs of uh, the pictures uh, or the uh, nanoparticles of hydroxyapatite prepared for Johnson and Johnson Company. Uh, these are the hydrothermally prepared beautiful nanoparticles um, and either to, you know, before we publish this uh, hydrothermal, uh, you know, uh, hydrothermally synthesized nanoparticles, no other group in the world had reported such beautiful nanoparticles of um, uh, hydroxyapatite under hydrothermal conditions with different morphology. And these are the uh, X-ray diffraction patterns to show their pure hydroxyapatite and uh, some mixture, uh, uh, mixed phases uh, depending on uh, the concentration of uh, the dopants or uh, uh, you know uh, the carbonates or some um, impurities present. And here, uh, this is the particle size distribution. Uh, these uh, hydroxyapatite nanoparticles disperse very well both within ethanol and water. And we have measured the particle size distribution both in ethanol and uh, water. And this is the uh, infrared spectrum of uh, hydrothermally prepared hydroxyapatite nanoparticles, very beautiful spectrum. And uh, we found quite a good amount of uh, carbon uh, carbonate here. And uh, you can see here electron photomicrographs of um, the hydroxyapatite powders uh, synthesized uh, using the mechanochemical hydrothermal technique, that is, uh, Hydrothermal is one technique and mechanochemistry is, uh, that is uh, grinding is another uh, uh, technique. Both are combined together. We get such beautiful nanoparticles. Uh, so you can see here A and B are the temp photographs of as prepared um, uh, HAP. And this one is uh, the TEM microphotograph um, uh, after sintering at 900 degrees C for one hour. So you get you know, a kind of secondary reaction after sintering. Then this is uh, the field emission scanning electron micro, micrograph of um, as uh, prepared um, sodium carbonate uh, doped uh, HAP powder to get the carbonate into the system. Okay, and we can remove sodium easily uh, by dissolving in water. 
So these inserts shows the uh, EDS or the electron diffraction patterns for these. And these are the pictures, uh, field emission scanning electron microscope images of the pure, and uh, uh, this is the pure uh, hydroxyapatite prepared using the uh, mechanochemical hydrothermal reactions. And this is one weight percent doped magnesium doped, and this is three weight percent magnesium doped. As you increase the concentration of the magnesium, the crystallinity decreases in the hydroxyapatite. We have studied in depth continuously, you know, changing the concentration of the magnesium. We have recorded the powder X-ray diffraction. And, it, you know, as you can see here, from the pure HAP to magnesium doped HAP, when you increase to 5 weight percent, the crystallinity decreases. And also you can see some additional amorphous phases uh, maybe. So these are the 10 images uh, of um, the as prepared hydroxyapatite using the mechanochemical processing method and heat treated uh, at 900 degrees centigrade. Okay. So, so this is uh, one of the beautiful pictures I have taken from Journal of Materials Chemistry, uh, published by Guerli, an Italian group, wherein they have deposited uh, two antibiotics uh, uh, like uh, ciprofloxacin and uh, gentamicin sulfate uh, loaded onto hydroxyapatite. And they have taken after, uh, you know, like uh, 30 days or so, they have taken the same images uh, to see how these are coated, how these, uh, uh, you know, antibiotics are coated. And this is now the last part is uh, the syn synthesis of uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles for uh, biomedical applications and also dentistry. And this is the biohydrothermal synthesis process wherein we start with um, some phyto aqueous phyto extracts, maybe from uh, Voxantum, then uh, maybe uh, Gestigia vinardensis uh, uh, and uh, Emblica officinalis, and even honey we have used. And uh, this is uh, the one molar zinc nitrate solution and bioreduced zinc oxide and uh, treated uh, under hydrothermal condition, that is biohydrothermal. We get zinc oxide nanoparticles coated with plant materials. Um, and uh, you can, this is how you can see, and you can remove uh, by centering at uh, 650 degrees C, all these biomolecules you can remove and retain perfect, uh, you know, uh, unagglomerated nanoparticles of zinc oxide, which you can use uh, in various applications. And we have tested the in vitro toxicity by carrying out the hemolysis and the cytotoxicity on these biohydrothermally synthesized zinc oxide. And we have uh, the sample, what we prepared, and this is the commercially available zinc oxide. And our results show very good, uh, you know, uh, results with the hemolysis uh, well within the toxicity range. We didn't exceed 3% in our samples. And the same thing with um, the cytotoxicity, and this was well within uh, the control. And we have tested uh, the, now I need just another five minutes, uh, uh, Dr. Seema Deshmukh, may I use uh, just five minutes? No issues, sir, no problem. Okay. So we have measured here, yeah, this is all the work of uh, Dr. P. Shubha, who is also a member of this uh, uh, SIG group. Uh, this is the in vitro, uh, in vivo toxicity study of the zinc oxide nanoparticles uh, prepared. Uh, she used the Bambix Mori silkworm model. And uh, I will just explain uh, one by one. This is uh, a healthy control larvae, and this is the nano pure water treated uh, larvae. And this is the green synthesized ZNO treated larvae and commercially available zinc oxide treated larvae. And this one is um, the cocoons from uh, the biohydrothermally treated larvae. And uh, now you can see here, uh, available zinc oxide shows the maximum uh, larval depth. And also here, the size of the cocoon, it is uh, very, high in this case uh, when you uh, biohydrothermal zinc for the lava and the yield is uh, the yield of silk is also very high 
So this is a, a very interesting, uh, you know, work. And you can see here in the silk uh, fibers uh, coating with um, zinc oxide nano particles, these two are magnification showing the coating and uh, the picture uh, C shows flakes and spherical shaped zinc oxide nanoparticles on the fiber uh, with uh, 100 micrometer resolution and D demonstrates a single strand of uh, silk fiber uniformly coated with the zinc oxide nanoparticles with further higher resolution. We have tested the uh, silk fibers um, coated with uh, zinc oxide for the surgical applications. Uh, and this is the uh, EDS um, uh, electron diffraction spectroscopy uh, on the zinc oxide coated on uh, uh, silk fiber surfaces to show the presence of zinc and uh, oxygen only and no other uh, uh, elements are present. Uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, the silk fibers having only zinc oxide. And uh, also uh, the presence of this uh, C, N, O, Z, N, all these, uh, this is uh, uh, C, C, N, O, these are the peaks uh, due to the organic substances present in the silk, uh, especially the protein uh, part present in the silk, okay? So we have tested the antibacterial activity of this biohydrothermally synthesized zinc oxide nanoparticles coated on the silk fibers. We have used S areas bacteria to test the antibacterial, uh, antibacterial activity of the zinc oxide uh, coated silk fibers. And uh, uh, so we have carried out for six consecutive days such a test until last day, the nanoparticles coated threads retained antibacterial activity. So the activity didn't reduce, uh, uh, you know, significantly. The uncoated silk fibers did not show any such antibacterial activity. So this has um, very good applications in the surgical uh, uh, side. <clears throat> now this one shows biohydrothermally synthesized zinc oxide nanoparticles. Um, uh, we have tested the surface roughness of these um, uh, zinc oxide uh, synthesized. Uh, using this, uh, you know, on the denter base, we have uh, distributed these uh, zinc oxide, hydrothermally synthesized zinc oxide nanoparticles. Uh, and also, uh, this is on the heat cured acrylic denture base uh, resin in 0.5% and 1% uh, uh, weight per volume ratio. The surface roughness and average structural strength were studied. And interesting thing is, um, Zinc oxide nanoparticles reduce the surface roughness of heat cure acrylic denture based resin specimens as evident from the uh, uh, atomic force microscopic studies. And I have shown here the surface roughness of the pure uh, den uh, denture based resin specimen 0 0.28 plus or minus 0 0.04 microns. And, um, uh, nanoparticles, uh, zinc oxide nanoparticles incorporated showed much less. Uh, uh, this is uh, 0.11 plus or minus 0 0.06 microns. And the last slide is uh, cytotoxicity evaluation we have carried out using this uh, bulb uh, 3T3 cancer cells. And um, uh, these are the nanoparticles of zinc oxide distributed on um, the graphene oxide. Okay. And these um, uh, actually, this picture shows uh, the O centum reduced graphene oxide is more biocompatible with bulk 3T3 fibroblast cell lines. So we didn't have the zinc oxide, sorry. Uh, this is uh, the pure graphene oxide, okay? But prepared using this uh, biomolecules to check the cellular growth. And to finally summarize, uh, Processing of advanced nanomaterials for dentistry is a fast emerging area of research. HAP is one of the most promising bioceramic materials with a wide range of applications in dentistry. If prepared using an appropriate biosurfactant, it is going to replace most of the conventional bioceramics. Also for the coating on 
the solid implants like titanium metal and or even alumina and in tissue engineering hydroxyapatite is a very promising material 3d printing technology is going to play a major role in the coming years uh, in the 3d bioprinting of implants in dentistry and making it more economic faster and most efficient technique and conjugation of hydroxyapatite and other biocompatible calcium phosphate why i'm telling this is uh, even beta tcp is uh, often used in the implants and, uh, bio uh, coatings i mean coatings for the imp metal implants so these nanoparticles hap and uh, beta uh, tcp nanoparticle with an appropriate biomolecules if you can conjugate uh, or appropriate drugs it can open a new avenue in dentistry so thank you very much before i close i would like to uh, thank my indian collaborators uh, my colleagues uh, professor b basavalingu professor k m lokanathrai dr somshekar etirajan narayana shrikanta swami sarojini uh, dr veena who is uh, a dentist in kle college and dr prasanna uh, sunil in your uh, uh, jss college and uh, dr md pandareesh uh, Uh, Dr. Vivek, Dr. Meena Ketan Tripathi, Dr. Dinesh, and uh, Dr. Prashant Kalapa, who does, uh, I missed his name here, he does the 3D, print, 3D printing. And we have uh, the group members, Dr. K. Namrata, Abdul Azam, Meena Zare, Dr. Srinath, Dr. Shubha, Mr. Charles Vikas, uh, P. Abhishek. And we have uh, a host of uh, foreign collaborators with whom we have published uh, Uh, even publishing regularly professor yoshimura kohesoga ajiri all from japan and uh, etohoku university is number 1 in japan i spent uh, quite a good amount of time in uh, uh, in this uh, group working in uh, this number 1 university of japan and this is uh, uh, he is also working in uh, the tokyo institute of technology he retired from there recently and moved to this uh, uh, National Chengkung University. We have Raymond from uh, Rutgers University, where I carried out a lot of work on hydroxyapatite, uh, and in collaboration with Johnson and Johnson, whose headquarters is located in New Jersey only. And Professor Sanjay Mathur from the University of Cologne, and Professor Ajay and Vinu from the University of Newcastle, Australia. Professor Martin Hartmann from Erlangen University, Germany. <coughs> Professor Dermos. Um, Uh, from Qatar University, Qatar, and a host of other research uh, scholars and MTech students, uh, and these are some of the books I have published. Uh, not all uh, images are shown here. The first edition of the Handbook of Hydrothermal Technology published in two thousand one, and uh, the second edition of the Handbook of Hydrothermal Technology published by Healthsphere in two thousand thirteen, and now the third edition is under preparation, which uh, covers. mostly on the nanotechnology and this is the springer handbook of crystal growth um, prepared with my american uh, collaborators this is the second biggest book ever published by springer running to about 1847 pages a huge book weighing about 4 kilograms maybe and uh, this is another book um, handbook of crystal growth uh, technology i have dedicated to professor c n r rao i prepared this with uh, professor wahachi from doshisha university in kyoto and these are the other books this, this is my first book on hydrothermal growth of crystals uh, i prepared for the pergamon press oxford uk and these are the special editions of the journal of material science i edited uh, on novel solution processing of materials thank you very much for your kind attention now i am ready to answer any questions if you have or you can even contact me your email i did show in the beginning in the first slide itself my email yeah you can see here my thanks a lot sir thanks a lot for the extensive presentation it certainly shows the extensive amount of work which has gone through and i'm sure many minds are stimulated now 
for the different research ideas or the possible collaborations also where uh, they couldn't have been finding answers all these days where we could collaborate and work i'm sure now they are even ready uh, for all those collaborations and uh, shortly i'm sure we will be having lot of uh, work uh, going collaboratively there are a lot of questions um, uh, many uh, participants want to clarify certain doubts uh, uh, but i request the participants to kindly stay back uh, we would take up all the questions at the end of the session uh, now we have our uh, chief guest with us so uh, we would want to begin in with the uh, inaugural ceremony so i once again uh, uh, welcome all i welcome dr kushala pa sir uh, for this uh, uh, webinar thank you sir uh, with the blessings of almighty and uh, my humble pranams to his lotus feet of his holiness shri shri shivratri shwara deshikendra mahaswami ji i pray that his wishes are with us for this webinar on fostering research with dental materials which has been organized by the special interest group of quality and safe use of dental materials uh, this webinar has uh, been organized with a project that is the upgradation in the knowledge these special interest groups are unique uh, aspects of our university uh, which focus the interests of the researchers in a particular area that is what is very unique about this there are a group of researchers who are constantly working in a particular area and the jss academy of higher education and research is there with us to support us in our endeavors with this important objective uh, we began with the thought of this sig which was constituted in the year 2011 under the leadership of dr nandlal after that and presently with the able guidance of dr ravindra s we have been working constantly to upgrade this group to constantly to bring out upgradation clinically academically as well as from research perspective with this intention we recently reconstituted the group having expertise from different areas before i go ahead with anything else i would want to say a few words about dr sitramaya sir who has been the member of our special interest group we had been fortunate that he was there in our group but unfortunately few months back uh, we lost him uh, we deeply regret his loss there were a lot of projects in pipeline with him he was always motivating and encouraging us in spite of all his uh, commitments being a busy academician busy administrator busy researcher he yet used to give time for us we really regret his loss on the behalf of the special interest group i uh, i wish to express our gratitude towards all the contributions that he has done and we really feel sad today that he is not there uh, with us in this group moving on further with today's webinar uh we know dental materials these are the vast group of materials that we work on maybe from the simplest procedure like oral prophylaxis that we perform to the most complex restorative care endodontic therapy or periodontal therapy we use vast varieties of dental materials like from dental impressions basic impressions to fabrication of crowns to fabrication of any highly specialized materials we are constant uh, working with dental materials and from the beginning till date the dental materials have been expanding excessively and if there is excess extensive research happening within the field of dental materials so we as clinicians as researchers as academicians we also need to upgrade ourselves so with this aim the today's webinar was organized i now request our a group leader uh, dr ravindra s to kindly give the opening remarks good good afternoon everyone seeking the blessings of his holiness swami ji respected chief guest dr kushal appa director academics of jss ahr resource persons professor k bairappa 
Bachelor, Adi Chinchinagiri University, Dr. Kishore, Associate Professor and Head of the Department of Central Materials, Manipal University, members of SIG group, students and all the attendees. This SIG group was constituted as there is an enormous scope for materials in dentistry. Vision of this group is to conduct the research and have a collaboration and to develop a comprehensive ideas on materials used in dentistry. Of late, nanomaterial has gained a lot of interest in various biomedical as well as dental field. I am sure this webinar will enrich our knowledge on this emerging topic. At this juncture, uh, I would like to recall about uh, one of our SIG member, late Professor Sidramaya of JSS SNTU Mysuru, who had guided in many of our dental materials related projects. Finally, I thank all the resource persons for agreeing to share their expertise with us. Hope this webinar will be a fruitful to all of us. Thank you, one and all. Have a nice day. Thank you, sir. Uh, the efforts of SIG from its inception till date has been vehemently supported by Dr. Kushala Pasar, who is the director of academics, JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research. He had always been there constantly by us to support us, to guide us, to correct us. And his inspirations, his motivation has always made us improve in our endeavors. On this grand occasion of this webinar, your courteous presence as a chief guest is highly motivating for all of us, sir. We are all eagerly waiting to listen a few words of motivation from you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Seema. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to seek the blessings of His Holiness Swamiji and uh, bring his greetings as, as well as that of uh, my pro-chancellor, my uh, vice-chancellor and my registrar to the success of this webinar. And uh, I bring greetings from the university also to you all. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the webinar for uh, involving me. And uh, also, I'd like to say how proud I am to share the stage with uh, uh, such an eminent personality as Professor Bhairapa. So it's wonderful to be with you on the uh, uh, webinar. Sir. And uh, well, I would just uh, you know, uh, also like to condole the sad demise of uh, uh, the Professor Sidramaya. Uh, who was uh, instrumental in so much of advice for us from the engineering field. And uh, here, I'd, uh, being a proud member also of the SIG, uh, you all have uh, put me also into this uh, special interest group. So I'd at least uh, like to just brush up a little. I know all the experts in the field are listening to me, and I would not like to add anything after listening to Professor Bhairapa's uh, speech, it's like coming in after somebody has scored a double century and then uh, trying to win the crowd over. It's uh, impossible to do that. Uh, but uh, I would just like to uh, add a few words uh, about the dental materials and how proud I am that the uh, special interest group is going so fast and uh, so far ahead of the other special interest groups. Uh, dental materials, uh, you, as you all know, is the success of any dental procedure uh, right from choosing the right uh, material and uh, for its quality and uh, safety. Well, nanotechnology has given a techno boost to the improvement in dental materials and uh, Professor Bhairapa has just given an, us an invaluable insight into the materials and the use of nanotechnology. Uh, the dental surgeon not only chooses the right material, but uh, uh, this is from a purely uh, the dermatologist's point of view. The uh, dental surgeon also has to choose the right shade of the material to give the cosmetic effect. And every procedure has to have the specific dental material going by the property of the material. So this you, you all will know from this webinar how useful it is to select the right material. Uh, well, this special interest group has done a lot of research on many such materials. But what interested me most was the incorporation of medicaments in the dental polymers, making it invaluable for use in the oral cavity with its multitude of microorganisms. Well, uh, this may also pave the way for future use of medications from the transoral mucus route for many chronic illnesses. I think one of the research uh, uh, fields I which you all can concentrate on is this. And uh, this webinar uh, will be encouraging many of the listeners 
uh, to do research in this field uh, uh, in the use of the dental materials and uh, my warm wishes to the special interest group uh, dr ravindra uh, dr seema uh, member secretary dr indira dr nandlal uh, mr research of dental college then dr prashant uh, s and uh, a special greeting again to uh, vairapa sir uh, uh, warm wishes to you sir and uh, dr shubha we are proud of our alumni who has uh, uh, mastered in uh, material uh, sciences and uh, also dr pramod uh, whose valuable inputs are beneficial so uh, dr indira you are also doing a wonderful work uh, from the uh, pedodontic side and uh, i wish the success uh, of for this webinar i wish all success for this webinar and uh, i wish the uh, participants uh, wonderful academic learning today thank you very much for inviting me thank you sir thank you sir lord sir you never stop inspiring us your words are so motivating that we really feel like going ahead and working more and more so that we can contribute our little bit towards the upgrading or betterment of our uh, university I'm thank you sir and proud of you all and please continue to the good work thank you sir sir was extremely busy but he took out time uh, for this uh, inaugural session i am really thankful to you sir how many ever thanks i say maybe it would not be enough uh now i call upon uh, our very active and new member of our sig dr indira to kindly introduce the speakers Good afternoon, respected Kushala Professor, Ravinder Sir, Bairab Professor, Kishore Sir, and all the delegates. It's indeed an honor to introduce our uh, resource faculty for this seminar. Uh, Professor Bairab Professor, he obtained his master's degree from the University of Mysore with distinction, rank, and medals. He did his PhD and postdoctoral training from Moscow University, Russia. He has spent around thirty-one years at the University of Mysore at different capacities. presently he is a pro pro chancellor of adi kunjuri university he specialized in material sciences nanotechnology environmental engineering nanobiotechnology crystal engineering and crystal chemistry of materials he has his outstanding contribution in the field of material science especially on hydrothermal processing he has been recognized as one of the top 2% scientist in the world Uh, by a recent survey which was conducted by stanford university usa he is involved in interdisciplinary research and has generated more than 80 crore grants for university of mysore his individual contribution to the h index is more about 25% with the most highly cited papers in the academy he is also founder of center of material uh, science and technology and internal quality assurance cells at university of mysore he is a renowned academician and researcher with around 490 research publications in peer reviewed international journals with more than 9500 citation he is also known as world authority in hydrothermal technology with four patents he has edited numerous books uh, one of his uh, famous book is handbook of hydrothermal technology he has edited five special edi uh, editions of material science journals uh, published in usa uk and also germany he is an elected fellow of royal society of chemistry london elected fellow of world academy of ceramics italy elected fellow of uh, asia specific academy of materials japan and fellow of karnataka science and technology academy and fellow of many other indian academies he is also elected as a secretary general of asia's uh, pacific academy of materials he has re received several award one of, uh, among them are dr raja raman award for science and technology dr c v raman award in physical uh, physical uh, science and material research society of india medal and golden jubilee award he is awarded with c v raman birth century award for the year 2016 17 by our honorable prime minister um he has promoted uh, interdisciplinary research and some of his finest academy of all over the world to the my uh, and he has brought uh, finest academicians 
to the uh, Mangalore universities. Currently, Professor Bhairappa sir is working as a professor, uh, sorry, as a approach uh, vice chancellor of Adi Chinchingiri University, and he has initiated several innovative academic uh, programs in Adi Chinchingiri University with interdisciplinary research, innovations in medical, engineering, pharmacy, and applied science faculty. Today, he gave a lecture, uh, guest lecture on emerging trends in advanced nanomaterials for dentistry. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Indira. Uh, before we uh, go ahead with the next session, that is the next lecture, I would like to thank each and everyone who are here. I would initially like to thank uh, Dr. Kushalapa, sir, for sparing his time for the wishes uh, that he gave for us and for all the guidance that you always give and support us, sir. It really means a lot. It gives a direction for us to work on. Thanks a lot, sir. I would also like to thank our group leader, Dr. Ravindra S., who is constantly guiding us and motivating and stimulating our minds to work further and further on this SIG so that we can improvise this unique initiative. I would also thank our speakers of the day, uh, Dr. Bhairappa sir and Dr. Kishore for sparing their time. They had been uh, very patient with us with whatever hitches were there during the uh, planning of this uh, webinar. They had been constantly supporting and uh, uh, without any complaints, they had been there with us. Thanks a lot, sir. I am utmost thankful uh, to also uh, for bearing uh, with to all the participants for joining us with here today for this webinar. Uh, one session is already over, another session is in the pipeline, and I'm sure all are eagerly waiting to upgrade their knowledge and look on further what else can be done with the dental materials that we are having. A special mention to Dr. Prashant, who is also a member of this SIG, and he's an assistant director of academics for bringing in the applied aspect of the technological advancement in the academics and empowering us with the promo video. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. I would also thank Dr. Indira, member of SIG, for her support during the planning of this program. On the behalf of the SIG, we thank all the participants once again, and I would be failing in my duty if I would not thank the budding, talented, hardworking doctor who's constantly there behind the scene, helping us and connecting all of us virtually, Dr. Sumuk. Thanks a lot for all your patience and all the efforts that you take for bringing out our webinars and our uh, work so colorful. Thank you. Thanks. Sumuk, can you please be on video for a minute? Sumuk, uh, he's Dr. Sumuk. He's, a st he's our student and I feel so proud for uh, being here. I actually, he raised our level as teachers because uh, when the student is working so much, so hard, it gives us a boost to teach the students more. So uh, yeah. thanks a lot. Uh, with these uh, uh, remarks, I would conclude the inaugural uh, ceremony. Uh, we would be going ahead further towards the next uh, session. The question and answers of the previous uh, session would be taken up at the end of the second session. Uh, to Indira, if you could kindly introduce uh, Dr. Our next speaker is Dr. Kishore Ginjipalli. He is head of the Department of Dental Materials, Manipal College of Dental Sciences. He has received his PhD from MCOTS in 2015. He has 65 publications and four patents to his credit. He has been awarded with Dr. TMA Pi Gold Medal Award for his outstanding research publication. He has also received the Best Teacher Award, Innovation Award, Best Scientific Presentation Award at various conferences. He has been invited guest speaker at various national and international platforms. He is an excellent orator and his research interests are in the field of dental biomaterials and biodegradable polymers. Today, Dr. Kisho will be speaking on polymers with antimicrobial properties for prosthetic application. Over to you, sir. Is my screen visible to all of you? Yes, sir. Right. Very good evening to everyone. And... Uh... Greetings from Manipal to all of you. Uh, special thanks uh, to the organizers of uh, this webinar. And uh, it is, uh, as uh, Kushal Appasar was mentioning, it is very difficult to speak after an eminent professor like Bhairapasar. Uh, 
thank you bhairav sir for uh, enlightening us on the nano materials uh, greetings also to dr kushal appa sir dr ravindra sir dr indra madam dr somok and finally dr seema ma'am for coordinating with us uh, in uh, providing a platform to discuss with all of you the topic on polymers with antimicrobial properties for prosthetic applications uh this topic will be covered with specific emphasis on materials used for uh, making of uh, dentures the contents of the presentation are as follows a brief uh, discussion and introduction uh, we shall have about denture based materials and uh, the polymethyl methacrylate and as you all know one of the most common problem with wearing dentures is denture stomatitis after discussing about that we will discuss about different strategies that have been used to uh, combat the problem of denture stomatitis as we are all aware this is not only affect the function but also the aesthetic and psychological status of the patient and so uh, as well as aesthetic demands this has become more so important in these days where we are getting more and more evidence suggesting that there is a direct relation between oral health and overall health the world population is on the rise and so is the percentage of elderly population who require dentures an ideal denture based material that is used to fabricate these dentures should be a very good biocompatible material that should also satisfy very stringent requirements of uh, dental applications both in terms of mechanical chemical thermal and uh, aesthetic qualities the history of development of dental materials is quite long and there have been a variety of materials that have been introduced and ruled the field of uh, making dentures for a certain period of time until the most widely used material that is polymethyl methacrylate was introduced during the late 1930s although we have vulcanite cellulite and nylon or uh, and other uh, variety of materials each of them had some or the other problem which uh, made them very difficult to use for a long term clinical use the polymethyl methacrylate was first introduced uh, in the year 1935 as an organic glass because of its excellent transparent uh, property that it exhibits uh, but this is in the supply to us as sheets and cakes which made it very difficult to use it to fabricate the dentures but then uh, in the next few years they have introduced a polymerization technique which is called as bead polymerization or an emulsion emulsion suspension polymerization process which permitted uh, the polymethyl methacrylate to be fabricated in a small powder form in beads which could later be added to unpolymerized methyl methacrylate to form a dough which can be used in the present day compression molding technique and this material soon became the material of choice for mixing or for making complete dentures and uh, partial dentures as it exhibited excellent biocompatibility with good aesthetic qualities and a, a good dimensional stability as the material seemed to be very good in terms of biological compatibility and the properties the applications of this material also have been expanded and it is now used widely in other biomedical applications as well including for uh, the drug delivery application of dentures and orthopedic applications despite this the research has led to uh, in development of newer materials and also the processing techniques uh, each with certain amount of uh, advancement than the existing uh, fabrication technique or the material despite all these developments the polymethyl methacrylate still stood strong and this material is still and i i hope in in the coming years it will still be the choice of material because it it has excellent uh, properties in most of the terms in satisfying the requirements for making the denture despite all this uh, it is not a material uh, which is devoid of problems it still has uh, certain problems in terms of uh, mechanical characteristics and the uh, microbial adhesion so uh, with respect to the development of material science uh, and with respect to the amount of research that was uh, dedicated to develop new materials the problem of mechanical characteristics of dentures have partly been addressed 
and we now have certain materials which are uh, which possess a sufficient and adequate mechanical characteristics for denture applications however uh, the microbial addition of uh, microorganisms to the surfaces of the denture especially for polymethyl methacrylate surfaces is still an unresolved problem why do we need an antimicrobial activity uh, to a denture based material this is because the denture once it is given to a patient uh, it covers most uh, part of the oral, uh, oral cavity or large areas of oral tissues with the less amount of salivary flow there which are likely to get colonized by microorganisms and in case if you have a denture based material with the antimicrobial activity this activity would provide a denture with not permitting any adherence colonization or biofilm formation on the dentures which will prevent opportunistic infections especially in those patients uh, who are immunocompromised but unfortunately none of the commercially existing denture based materials have antimicrobial activity so since uh, in the absence of these antimicrobial activity uh, one of the uh, common problem that uh, patients uh, face wearing uh, dentures is the denture sore mouth or dentures tightness it is a opportunistic uh, opportunistic infection which is generally seen in large percentage of complete denture wearers where it is characterized by inflammation or erythema of denture wearing mucosa and this is variety of microorganisms contribute uh, to the onset of uh, uh, denture stomatitis among the microorganism candida albicans is the most prevalent one although we have certain other candida species which have been uh, isolated from the mouth of denture stomatitis patients the denture stomatitis all begins with the addition of candida albicans onto the surface of the dentures and with the time they colonize the surface of the dentures and form biofilms once a biofilm is formed they become more resistant for uh, uh, more resistant to antimicrobial action as well as uh, conventional cleansing procedures that are generally done on day to day basis and also they become more resistant to antimicrobial agent in addition to that uh, some of the candida uh, species that have been isolated from the the denture stomatitis have also been found to have superior adherence characteristics and also they have better resistance to antifungal agents that are used uh, in the treatment of denture stomatitis so there have been at least uh, four important factors that have been uh, attributed uh, for the candida albicans to adhere to the surface of the dentures first one is the surface roughness of the dentures as we all know uh, uh, denture uh, fitting surface or the intangible surface of the denture is never polished and this will uh, uh, facilitate or uh, uh, act as a breeding ground for the you know uh, colonization or adhesion of the candida albicans and any surface which is more than 0.2 microns will facilitate the adhesion of microorganisms and as the roughness of the denture increases it is likely that uh, there is a you know good place for the uh, both adhesion as well as colonization of the uh, microorganisms second one is the uh, salivary pellicle that forms on the surface of the denture for a period of time uh, initially it provides a suitable condition for the uh, adhesion of the microorganisms and later it also protects them from uh, antimicrobial action of the agents that are used next is the hydrophobic interactions uh, a very high contact angle that is formed by the polymethyl methacrylate and also its surface energy being close to some of the microorganisms will facilitate the easy colonization or adhesion of the microorganisms to the surface of the tension lastly the electrostatic interactions uh, a denture has uh, no ionic surface uh, with the lack of this ionic surface it does not attract or repel any of the microorganisms on to its surface however having a charged surface on the material especially the, the cationic surface or anionic surface will be sometimes beneficial especially if it has a negative charge 
saliva saliva has certain antimicrobial compounds which can then be adsorbed onto the surface which will prevent the easy colonization of the material in the absence of this charge it is likely that the microorganisms adhere better and faster to the denser base surfaces which are made of polymethyl methacrylate so conventionally denser stomatitis is uh, uh, treated with the multiple uh, on a multiple fronts including uh, advising the patient to follow a strict denture hygiene as well as oral hygiene and discouraging the uh, patients from wearing the dentures during the night and a variety of methods have been uh, mooted to you know do the disinfection of the dentures or cleansing of the denture by using a variety of you know chemical uh, denture cleansers and recently some uh, new uh, methods have been uh, used or uh, uh, found to be suitable for denture disinfection such as uh, microwave disinfection or photodynamic therapy to uh, remove the micro or, or to inactivate the microorganisms in some cases uh, there may be a, you know uh, possibility of uh, requirement of using certain antifungal therapy which can be either topical or systemic antifungal therapy in case of topical application we apply you know antifungal agent on the you know denture bearing surface of the oral cavity uh, which may not have efficient uh, action because of the washing away of the substance therapeutic substance by saliva for uh, in case of systemic antimicrobial therapy we intentionally use large quantities of anti uh, antifungal agent in order to ensure that uh, the dose of the you know therapeutic dose of the antifungal agent is maintained so that in turn would lead to uh, you know side effects uh, because of high concentration of antifungal agents so in the absence of uh, one size fits all strategy to combat this uh, denture stomatitis after its onset an effective strategy uh, to overcome this problem would be to look at how actually this problem arises or uh, and as we know the first and foremost important step in the the onset of denture stomatitis is it is the adhesion of microorganisms onto the surface of the dentures so looking at this problem from the perspective of prevention or uh, to combat this problem there have been three effective uh, strategies that have been designed which led to the development of uh, an effective strategy to prevent uh, uh, or minimize adhesion of the candida to the denture surfaces Uh, uh whenever you know it is about to be adhered or if at all if there is an adhesion how best we can delay the process of multiplication and colonization so in the first uh, stage we would have uh, an addition of an antimicrobial additive or biocidal compounds to the denture based materials to exhibit uh, antifungal activity and uh, the second uh, uh, strategy that can be used is to coat the surface of the denture which with a small film of antimicrobial agent which tenaciously bonds to the surface of the denture to prevent the candida adhesion and exhibit antimicrobial or antifungal activity and the last one and the most important one where the research is concentrated at the moment is to make the denture and their denture a antifungal material or antimicrobial material by incorporating immobilizable uh, biocidal compounds Uh, where uh, the antifungal or antimicrobial agent is chemically bonded to the polymeric matrix and these are the three things that we should discuss in detail or cleanse in the following slides biocidal additives are physically blended with the polymethyl methacrylate powder or with the methyl methacrylate monomer which are randomly and uniformly distributed throughout the resin matrix and they do exhibit antimicrobial activity by contact killing or by releasing themselves into the surroundings which will lead to less adhesion or killing of the uh, microorganisms a variety of materials have been used uh, as antimicrobial additives but the, with the advent of nano uh, technology uh, the direction towards using these materials were mostly in the form of uh, uh, nanoparticles as uh, by professor uh, eloquently spoke about uh, nanoparticles a variety of materials have been uh, you know can be synthesized and fabricated and used for dental applications and so is the case with the denture based materials as well so uh, uh, different varieties of materials have been used titanium dioxide as we all know is uh, one of the common uh, component that is used in the formulation of uh, dental materials to uh, uh, as an opacifying agent 
which is also a very highly biocompatible material with the uh, its color not much interfering with the aesthetics of the dental restorative materials it is quite uh, cheaper compared to rest of the nanoparticles and it it's, it can sometimes act as a filler and improve the mechanical characteristics of the material so that is why this is also been tried uh, to get uh, you know and added to uh, polymethyl methacrylate denture based material and especially it was observed that uh, uh, uv irradiation of uh, this material uh, and in the presence of ferric oxide the antimicrobial activity seemed to be complemented and it shows better antimicrobial activity next ingredient that was added uh, to denture based materials is the silver and uh, this silver is also used in the nanoparticle form and it has been used as a broad spectrum antimicrobial agent for a very very long period of time and uh, in the form of nanoparticles it has been widely used in a variety of biomedical applications and it has already been investigated widely as an antimicrobial agent in uh, dental adhesives and some of the dental resin materials as well so it is generally used as a powder or as suspension uh, which can be added both to polymethyl methacrylate or the, the methyl methacrylate monomer and some of the studies that have been conducted on this material does indicate that it it does incorporate uh, antimicrobial activity to the denture but uh, uh, there is a significant effect that this material shows on the color of the denture material uh, denture based material especially depending on the size of the uh, uh, nanoparticles next one that was uh, tried is the zinc oxide nanoparticles and the calcium oxide nanoparticles uh, some of these materials or the investigations uh, reveal that they are effective against uh, uh, candida albicans and uh, a wide variety of uh, bacteria and uh, they seem to be very good uh, choice of materials uh, when they are tested on isolated uh, uh, materials but when they are tested on biofilms they seem to be slightly less effective against the biofilms next important uh, nanoparticle that has been added to the denture is the zirconium oxide uh, material which is a highly inert uh, ceramic material and is uh, very uh, with a very good biocompatibility and when they have added these zirconia particles in the nano form they were able to produce a denture with the high density that means it has less porosity with very good mechanical properties and uh, such a denture with which has a very smooth surface and high density uh, will have less roughness and so uh, the addition of the uh, microorganisms will be less and in addition this material uh, being a you know color uh, uh, which is in line with the you know Uh, dental materials will also not affect the aesthetic qualities to a uh, significant effect and uh, gold and platinum material have also been experimentally tried uh, in the form of nanoparticles and they seem to be incorporating significant amount of antimicrobial activity uh, with the, you know with constant even in dose dependent manner as you can see from this graph uh, where uh, as the percentage of the nanoparticles of gold platinum and silver are increased in the denture based material you can see a you know significant reduction in the fungal adhesion on the surface of the denture but at the same time uh, if you were to look at the color of the uh, denture based materials you can see silver drastically changes the color of the uh, the material so that could possibly be one of the problems uh, when you are designing uh, materials with these nanoparticles Uh, mostly these nanoparticles uh, will have this antimicrobial action basically by uh, exhibiting uh, uh, reacting with the cell walls or the cell membrane of the microorganisms or the nanoparticles may bond with some of the microbial enzymes lead to their inhibition or uh, inhibition of the protein synthesis or they may arrest the the replication of the DNA in the material so uh, by the, when you are considering these nanoparticles as additives to uh, some of the dental materials in general and polymethyl methacrylate in particular there are two things that one should consider one is uh, the size shape and morphology of the material the other one is the concentration of the nanoparticle so when we look at the nanoparticles uh, when as we all aware that nanoparticles are superior because they have they are very small in size their surface area is very very high so their antimicrobial activity increases with the reduction on the reduction in the size of the material 
but as the surface of the you know size of the material decreases they have an increased uh, tendency to get agglomerated of course now there are a variety of methods which can prevent these agglomeration but nevertheless as the size reduces there is always a scope and increased chances of agglomeration once the particles start agglomerating their surface area that is exposed will get reduced which may reduce the antimicrobial action of these materials the second factor that needs to be considered is the concentration or the dose or the amount of material in the denture bases uh, as the percentage of nanoparticles are increased in the denture bases they do exhibit better and superior antimicrobial activity but as was mentioned in there and previously that uh, the chances of agglomeration also will increase so once you have these agglomerated nanoparticles in the denture bases it is likely that they may have detrimental effects on the uh, uh, surface properties of the materials and also the mechanical characteristics of the denture base so alternative to these nanoparticle materials some of the fluoride releasing materials have also been uh, investigated to impart antimicrobial activity to the you know denture base materials so these uh, uh, surface free reactive glass fillers or other fluoridated glass fillers which think uh, which release a lot of fluoride which is an uh, you know uh, as we all know a karyostatic material and also uh, other uh, anions and cations that will be released will exhibit anti or impart antimicrobial activity to the materials Antiacetic acid is also been used uh, as an additive to polymethyl methacrylate, which makes the surface of the polymethyl methacrylate highly hydrophilic. And these hydrophilic surfaces were found to have less adhesion and the growth of candida albicans. But uh, addition of this uh, particular additive to the material at especially higher concentrations seem to be cytotoxic uh, to the uh, tissue uh, to the cells. Uh, alternatively some of the materials which are extracted from natural sources have been added uh, materials such as neem powder henna powder and tea tree oil have been added to denture bases and their antimicrobial properties have been evaluated and they, there seem to be a consensus that these materials uh, definitely exhibit uh, antimicrobial properties uh, with in a dose dependent manner and sometimes some of the materials may be better uh, uh, efficient in compared to the other uh, synthetic materials but uh, their long term effect and efficacy on the antimicrobial properties as well as the mechanical and physical properties of the denture bases have not been uh, reported widely so uh, coming to uh, in a small uh, brief overview on these additives uh, the preparation of uh, an antimicrobial denture by adding these blended uh, blended additives is quite simple but uh, uh, the release the rate of release of these additives uh, is uh, going to be a problem because it cannot be controlled easily and uh, as the release or the chances of them losing from the matrix uh, would pose a problem of antimicrobial activity being reduced over a period of time and addition of these additives may also probably affect the mechanical and physical properties of the material and also the possible toxic effects of these additives cannot be proved up so to overcome the drawbacks of these additives which requires large quantities of uh, antimicrobial additives to be added to the tinctures uh, there have been two uh, uh, processes that have been uh, you know indicated one is to modify the surface of the material or uh, use a small uh, thin film of antimicrobial uh, film on the surface of the tinctures so first we shall see what is done in the surface treatment a cold plasma has been used uh, to uh, form a thin film of fluoride or to uh, you know provide a doping of fluoride onto the surface of the denture bases which will you know have a negative charge and as we all know uh, some of the fungi especially the candida albicans also has a net negative charge on the surface so that repulsive repulsive force would not permit easy addition of the candida onto the surface of the dentures uh, the other uh, factor that are the properties or the uh, strategies that have been used are uh, use of different uh, antifungal materials as a thin film which bonds firmly to the surface of the the denture bases and modifies the properties of the surface of the denture base such as roughness hydrophobicity or porosity in the denture bases and create a, a surface character onto the surface of the denture which provides a surface that is difficult to get adhered to 
So uh, two octal cyanoacrylate and siloxane coatings have been widely used. Both of these coatings will make the surface of the denture highly hydrophilic, which will reduce the you know and uh, microbial adhesion. But the one that is made with the polysiloxane material seems to be highly inert and biocompatible, and it also provides long lasting. Uh, other uh, coatings in the form of jetrion or hydrophilic monomers, diamond-like carbon coating, or a fibrin biopolymer with the natural and synthetic uh, additives have been added. And all these have uh, significantly reduced the addition of uh, antimicrobial uh, microorganisms onto the surface of the material. But the one uh, which is uh, used as a fibrin biopolymer with the natural plants that uh, it used seem to be, you know, the one with the chlorohexidine additive seem to be uh, better efficient compared to the one with the natural additive. Kytosan as a low molecular weight uh, polymeric solution has been used as a uh, thin film coating on the surface of the denture. In the laboratory studies, the kytosan as an individual material did show a very good antifungal activity and it also has antimicrobial activity. But the moment it is used as a viscous solution and applied onto the surface of the denture, uh, they were uh, found to have a little less encouraging uh, effect in the sense that uh, they in fact, facilitated the you know uh, adherence of the candida albicans. This uh, purely could be the problem of the you know uh, viscosity of the solution or the you know kind of solvent or the method of application on the surface of the dentures. So both uh, the biocidal additives as well as the coatings have certain limitations. What are those limitations? That these materials can anytime leach out of the resin matrix. And a uh, surface modified denture based material may not be effective as uh, you know the charges on the uh, surface of the denture may get removed during the processing of the dentures. So, an alternative strategy would be to uh, localize and uh, uh, polymerize the material into the, into the material. This concept was called immobilization of the antimicrobial agents, which was noted by Imijato and its colleagues. Where they have uh, added uh, certain copolymerizable, uh, you know, antifungal or antibacterial additives to the polymer. So one of the strategies uh, to combat the dentist stomatitis is to use uh, copolymerizable monomers in such a way that you can make the surface of the denture highly negative charge. So this negative charge on the surface of the denture will also will repel the Candida from uh, Candida because they also have a net negative surface charge, and that will not uh, permit these Candida to get adhered onto the surface of the material. Uh, whereas a surface which doesn't have any charge or which has a positive charge possibly encourages the adherence of uh, these Candida albicans and the onset of venture. So there have been two uh, things that have been done to get this negative charge onto the surface of the venture. First uh, thing that was done was by using a carboxylic acid uh, polymerizable monomers in the form of metacrylic acid. But uh, addition of these uh, negative carboxylic acid uh, polymers were found to be slightly mm, affect the you know, mechanical properties of the material, and also you know their uh, biocompatibility has not been you know evaluated thoroughly. So. Uh, then they have alternatively proposed the use of uh, phosphate containing monomers. You can see up on the screen a variety of phosphate containing materials, especially ethylene glycol metacrylate phosphate, uh, has been used. The reason why they uh, I, uh, thought of using uh, phosphate is phosphate is a natural you know, uh, material that uh, is there in the saliva, both calcium and phosphate are there in the saliva, and uh, that is how they help in providing a, you know, uh, an environment that is free of uh, uh, the non-conducive to the microbial colonization. So by adding these phosphate uh, base, phosphate containing ions onto the surface of the, uh, I mean, co-polymerizing these materials onto the surface of the materials, will provide a net negative charge which will exhibit the antimicrobial activity. But uh, one of the problems that was, uh, you know, identified uh, with these phosphate-containing materials, although they exhibit uh, a superior antimicrobial or antifungal activity compared to carboxylic acid with a better biocompatibility, since these negative phosphate ions can possibly attract the calcium, especially you know, in the uh, 
uh, saliva, which can once it gets you know chelated onto the surface of these phosphate containing materials, it is uh, the efficacy of that particular surface will be lost. So you need to regenerate that surface by chelating that calcium out of the surface of these phosphate containing denture bases, which will be time consuming. That and also uh, the thermal stability of these phosphate containing monomers is not been out yet. And their biocompatible germs, biocompatibility has also not been evaluated thoroughly. The other that was to microbial was to use a quaternary based salt and use these quaternary ammonia based salt as a copolymerizable monomer. And these monomers generally have a biocidal group, which is you know uh, attached to a polymerizable uh, group. And then it, when it when we add these materials to so the polymethyl methacylate denture based material, the methacylate group bonds to the polymethyl methacylate chain and then immobilizes the antimicrobial activity so that this antimicrobial material will stay with the material without releasing and exhibit antimicrobial property for a long duration of time. And some of the salts that are used in quaternary uh, uh, have certain halogen ions incorporated such as fluoride, chlorine, bromine and iodine and those that are with the bromine and iodine may also have this steady opacity effect which is also one of the requirement for denture based material. So in general antimicrobial monomers exhibit uh, contact killing effect on the materials uh, or they may also drain the components of the you know microbial uh, organism uh, by creating an osmotic pressure or they may disrupt the you know uh, Cytoplasmic membrane of the microorganism leading to cell microorganisms. A variety of my antimicrobial organ monomers have been investigated, and all these monomers have been experimentally investigated at the laboratory level by adding them in different percentages to the denture based materials. So, all these were found to uh, impart a good amount of uh, antimicrobial activity to the denture bases. We shall see uh, each one of them individually as to how uh, uh, they fare in terms of uh, their uh, efficacy in imparting the uh, uh, antimicrobial activity to the denture base. The first is the quaternary ammonium methacrylate, which is a well known antiseptic material with a very uh, known bio, known biocompatibility with a, and, uh, and is also a very broad spectrum antimicrobial agent. And it exhibits antimicrobial activity by uh, having intrinsic detergent effect washes of these materials and also anti-adhesive properties that it exhibits. And because of its uh, low toxicity and wide and broad spectrum activity, it has already been used in a variety of personal hygienic products. And when we add this material to uh, polymethyl intaculate material, it does impart antifungal and anti-candidal activity to the material. And one of the most widely investigated antimicrobial monomer was uh, MDPP. So, which is been a material which has a low decal pyrogenium group, uh, which has been attached to a methyl methacrylate group uh, so that it can get immobilized in the the, the basement. And very well uh, antibacterial as well as antifungal activity. And the monomer uh, also is found to reduce the uh, chances of demineralization around the orthodontic brackets. That is, you see these materials being uh, widely used or as an additive in most of the antibiotic agents these days. And it also, uh, uh, in the form of unpolymerized uh, uh, monomer, it is slightly cytotoxic. And the synthesis of this material uh, involves some of the expensive chemicals. So, uh, PB. Uh, it is very much similar to MDPB, except that this material has one less carbon in the uh, aliphatic chain, uh, because of which it is a very cost-effective monomer and easy to produce. And it also exhibits better antimicrobial activity at a lesser concentration compared to MDPB. Uh, but this material is also, they say it is slightly less cytotoxic, but it is as cytotoxic as HEMA and UDMA that are generally used in dental restorative materials. But the addition of this particular monomer was found to uh, reduce the flexural strength and color stability of the denture based materials. Experimentally, they have tried other materials such as IDMA1 uh, and IDMA2. Both of them are similar to MDPP in terms of their activity, 
but they seem to be slightly more cytotoxic compared to MDPV materials. And DME, DMEAS uh, monomer, which is uh, you know slightly uh, cytotoxic in unpolymerized material, but uh, upon polymerization, this material exhibits a good amount of uh, uh, and uh, good amount of biocompatibility and also antimicrobial activity. The next monomer that was widely investigated is the DMA DDM, which exhibits very good biocompatibility with long-lasting uh, antimicrobial action. It has been widely used in a variety of uh, dentin bonding agents, uh, and it imparts a uh, high hydrophilic property and also a, you know, provides a positive surface, uh, which uh, will uh, not permit uh, some of the uh, bacteria or microorganisms to get adhered to the surface of the dentures. So some of the experimental studies show that it significantly inhibits the formation of uh, uh, biofilms on the surface of a variety of material, including the glass animal materials. Another uh, monomer is DDMAI, uh, as it has iodine in its uh, composition. It also imparts radiopacity along with the antimicrobial property. But one of the problem with this particular monomer is that it is slightly less soluble. Uh, which means that we will not be able to add this monomer in large quantities of dentin based material. Uh, and if you use it in a smaller quantity, monomer may not exhibit sufficient antimicrobial activity. Next material was the DAPCO derivatives that have been used, which are highly positively charged. And, uh, and some of the monomers which can readily withstand the heat curing process that are generally done during the fabrication of dentures. And uh, some of these derivatives which contain bromide in their composition were found to uh, interfere with the polymerization process and thereby producing a denture that is weaker and not that easy. To address this problem, some of the derivatives, uh, modified derivatives containing fluoride have been introduced. But these fluorides being slightly more slightly higher. So, an alternative they have worked on which is very good in terms of practical effect and also going to be very good in terms of my uh, next uh, monomer is DMA monomer, which has a composition which has uh, antimicrobial activity both on bacteria as well as fungi. Some of the experiments antimicrobial action is less especially in films, and it also you know deleteriously affects the, the flexural strength of the denture based material, which can present now, ma'am. Yeah, your presentation is visible. Thank you. The next number that has been tried is which is monofunctional uh accurate monomer. Activity, but material uh, reduces the characteristics of the material even if it is used in a percentage way of a uh, person. Next is uh, zinc methacrylate monomers that also have been tried and investigated. And the recent trend is to use a combination of antimicrobial monomers with the nanoparticles, and uh, a lot of work is in progress in, in this aspect where they found that both antimicrobial active uh, monomer along with the nanoparticle so a very good uh, complementary effect, uh, thereby reducing the addition and polymerization uh, of uh, uh, candida albicans, which will basic reason for the denture of stomatitis. The limitations and uh, current trends of on this particular area is uh, most of the investigation or the research that is being conducted this area is based on the in vitro studies, which does not uh, uh, simulate the oral conditions. And it is also equally important for us to correlate the, the results that have been obtained in in vitro studies onto the, you know, uh, onto the in vivo uh, in, uh, performance of these materials. That way, there are some new uh, micro uh, uh, And some of the newer process technologies, especially the uh, CAD CAM and the 3D printing uh, methods, as Bairapasar was mentioning, uh, a research uh, uh, and 
for materials as well as technologies sumuk so, i think we lost the connection again. yes ma'am we have lost the connection again uh, sir will be joining back soon yeah these are some of the reflections in the preparation of this uh, presentation i thank you all your patient listening and if you have any doubts or clarifications you uh, thank you all thank you one thank you sir for the wonderful presentation uh, now we'll go with the question and answer session uh, there are few questions to bairappa sir um, akisho sir there are few questions for you yes ma'am yeah um, one of the participant has asked which is the best antimicrobial monomer which can be used in obturators while doing uh, obturators for cleft lip and palate children uh it is uh, as i was mentioning at my concluding remarks that uh, most of the monomers have been tested in the laboratory stages which do show very good antimicrobial activity but uh, clinical studies based on these materials are uh, you know very scarce and we do not have much amount of information as to how these materials behave in vivo so uh, in the absence of that result it would be very difficult to you know say that this is the best material or this is the best antimicrobial because work in in terms of developing these materials is still in the process but uh, of course uh, uh, as a part of the research uh, some of these monomers have been tried uh, to get you know to be incorporated into denture based materials one uh, you know mdpb and dma ddm all these monomers certainly have shown but how long they will you know uh, be very effective and especially when you are saying obturators and other things they do requires you know specific requirements in terms of uh, which are very different than uh, kind of a denture based material so uh, i would not like to you know uh, give a specific monomer uh, as an ideal material but uh, it would be the choice uh, uh, that would be made based on the existing literature with the you know supporting literature that is available on this material because you will need to look at bio compatibility and uh, a lot of uh, other properties uh, when you look at these okay sir thank you so one more question is um, is this antimicrobial monomers effective more against bacteria or fungus yeah uh, that is uh, i would i would consider it as a good question because uh, uh, the microfungus have different surface charges uh, depending on you know different types of uh, you know microorganisms so take some of the bacteria they may have a net positive charge on the surface some of the fungi may have especially the candida they have a negative surface so if you uh, if you are considering a, a, a material a monomer the negative charge being very good uh, then we would be you know uh, doing little uh, a uh, little exaggerating uh, the effect of the material because when it is negative it would attract the positively surface charged microorganisms when it is positively charged it will start attracting the and uh, considering the oral uh, cavity and with uh, you know wide variety of microorganisms it would be you know difficult to say whether a negative charged one is better or a positive charged one so function uh, by looking at the denture and it was the significant problem that we get is the denture stomatitis and we all know that around 90% of the patients who have these denture stomatitis will have it because of the candida albicans and because uh, we already know that ne negative charge is there on the ne uh, candida albicans most of the research using these uh, antimicrobial monomers are generally you know, uh, formulated in the negative so other than that it, it is uh, you know it could be both positive as well as negative will definitely be useful depending on which organism you are actually trying to target thank you so one more question is is there fluoride releasing monomers uh the very fact that fluoride monomer uh, as a copolymerizing agent is to uh, into the denture base so that it stays there for a very long period of time and it does exhibit antimicrobial activity as long as it is in the in the matrix but if some of them releasing fluid uh, they may be very effective as long as it is there and once the fluid is you know gets depleted from the surface you would have lost the antimicrobial activity so 
should not be able to have a number which releases the flow rate because you'll, the effect is going to be transient. Rather, you should have some some monomers which will be there on the you know, uh, automatically. And this will have reliability as long as the material stays within the engine based material. The next question is how to prevent agglomeration of nanoparticles when added to polymer during polymerization? I'll repeat the question. Yeah, the, uh, agglomeration of yes, nanoparticles yes. when added to polymer during polymerization. Yeah, uh, that uh, there are certain some surface, uh, you know, uh, coatings available uh, with certain so some of the nanoparticles available. Uh, uh, Generally, these nanoparticles get agglomerated because of very surface energy. So, if you can coat the surface for a certain period of time or a brief period of time, uh, you can prevent their agglomeration. And uh, some of the methods, uh, including ultrasonication and uh, you know some of the you know dental uh, techniques that involve amalgamation, also been tried. But uh, there will still be some amount of agglomeration, but it can be avoided by coating these uh, nanoparticles with a surface coating agent for a you know, certain period of time, which is compatible with the processing method that we use. That is definitely possible. Okay, so thank you. So uh, one more question is, when we compare the antimicrobial monomers with surface, uh, surface coating of denture bases with antimicrobial agents, which one do you feel would be the better area of research? Uh, it depends on what you actually, uh, uh, you know, intent of the research. Your, if your intent of the research is a, a low cost solution, uh, coating would be the best one because uh, you can just apply the coat and then, uh, you know, you will have the material at a very, you know, uh, it will be slightly easier to make and it is, you know, very, you know, low cost solution. But uh, if you look at the long term efficacy of that uh, coating would be something, you know, which uh, will be very difficult to, you know. Um, stand by. Whereas if you are looking at, uh, you know, a long-term antimicrobial activity, then obviously the antimicrobial monomers are the materials uh, that are to be used because uh, in case of coating, you are just making the surface of the denture only, you know, antimicrobial. You are not making the entire surface, entire denture base as an, you know, antimicrobial material. Whereas if you use an antimicrobial monomer, it is, it is going to be in the structure, in the matrix of the material, which makes a complete denture as an antimicrobial material. So I would go with an antimicrobial monomer, but that would require, you know, challenging, uh, you know, design of the monomer. And then, you know, we'll have to see how it is going to affect the mechanical properties, biological characteristics of the material, which you may not have to give that much importance if you're going to develop a surface coating to the dentures. So one more question. What is the shelf life of antimicrobial polymers? Uh, it depends on you know uh, kind of monomer that you are using and the you know kind of antimicrobial additive or the group that is there in the material, especially those that contain uh, you know fluoride or halogen containing material may not remain effective for a very long period of time. Other simple uh, monomers which do not have long chain or you know uh, very large bulky groups will definitely stay in the material for a long period of time. One last question. Uh, the nanoparticles which is incorporated into the poly polymer will have the tendency to get accumulated without getting this first uniformly in the matrix. Uh, how this can be overcome? Yeah, I think uh, we have addressed this question previously as well, that agglomeration is definitely a problem as we, you know, Keep on reducing the size of the nanoparticles. Yes. So that is something that we need to live with. But uh, there are certain uh, alternatives ways. Of, um, as I mentioned, you can coat these particles and uh, prevent them from agglomeration. But that certainly is going to be a challenging task when you are going to increase their concentration or reduce the size of the nanoparticles. Thank you so much. Uh, so there are a few questions to Bhairapa sir also. Yeah, yeah. Please yes. go ahead. Sir, uh, one second. Sir. Just a minute. Sir. Yeah. Um, why is zirconium is not good, uh, a very good biocompatible material? And what is the melting range of this zirconium? No, uh, the melting point of zirconium, it again depends on the 
what crystal phase it is or structure it may be trigonal it may be tetragonal it may be cubic but normally we prefer the cubic tet- cubic zirconia which is very hard and its uh, melting temperature is about uh, 2750 and it can be even more and it is quite tough to handle not that very easy you know to uh, use zirconia and to make the shape and uh, also uh, to make uh, you know the dental fixtures and all that not that very easy to handle because of its very high hardness but uh, at the same time it's business? a very you know a kind of uh, i don't say it's uh, uh, not uh, biocompatible it is biocompatible it again depends on how you modify its uh, surface yeah the modification the charge uh, you know what do you prefer how you get it uh, without uh, losing you know it's uh, what you call toxic i mean it should not become toxic while modi- modifying its uh, charge all those things uh, should be taken into account it depends again on uh, uh, the target you are looking at what bacteria like negative or positive all these things uh, you know so one more question is can modifiers be added separately to hydroxyapatite crystals by hydrothermal method Uh, well it is possible yes definitely that is not in situ modification but in situ modification is the one uh, you know where you can really play you know with the molecules you can make them you know whatever the size you want to give to the particles you can give whatever uh, you know the shape you want to give you can give whatever uh, charge you want to give you can give but in case of post functionalization uh the things uh, you know the parameters are restricted you can only change the charge that's all you can't control the size you should uh, you know get uh you know the particles with uh, desired particle size you should have then only you can think of post functionalization and again that is possible definitely but uh, what we all try to do is uh, we try to create the particles with the desired surface morphology desired surface chemistry desired surf- i mean size uh, so many other things you know like that it is just like uh, you know in 2000 uh, wherever you go in most of the american laboratories research labs they used to say uh, today i can tell an atom where to go and what to do okay i can tell an atom where to go and what to do so such placards used to be very common and in the same way you know this uh, in situ surface modification is something like uh, molecular engineering you know this is what i do at present i can you know do what i want at the molecular level at the time of uh, the crystallization so that is much more uh, handy handier than uh, going to the post functionalization this is what i feel um, so there is one more question to dr kisho uh, can we cross link naturally available short chain polymers with pmma monomer as a copolymer at least uh, uh, as far as i know they haven't been much uh, uh, work on that front uh, probably that would be an area where they can actually look at Uh, but uh, challenge would be as by professor was mentioning functionalization of those materials and then you know bring them down to a scale which is uh, amenable for incorporating into the dental based materials that will definitely be a possibility but uh, work uh, is you know to be done in in that uh, area uh, so one more question is how about the addition of organism with nanopolymers yeah that that is the sole idea of modifying the dangerous surface with these uh, exactly. you know nano monomers because as you bring down the surface uh, you know size of the material they have they possess inherently very different uh, properties than when they are in macro form so that is the reason why you know everybody is interested in uh, pursuing uh, you know research in terms of using nano particles or nano size material they definitely have less amount of uh, you know microbial addition compared to when they are in macro form so one more question is uh, does any metal or an alloy have an anti caries activity 
uh, as such as an as a metal uh, they they may you know of course uh, every uh, metal and metal oxides they they inherently possess those uh, you know antimicrobial or anti fungal activity uh, best example is the silver so we have been using it for you know such a long time uh, as an antimicrobial material and uh, there have been several examples if you were to put pure gold pure platinum palladium all these man metals they do exhibit these uh, antimicrobial properties and we want to en enhance their activity by reducing them into a nanoparticle form and then you know harness that uh, better property of those materials for uh, dental applications i would like to add uh, you know a few points uh, here even zinc oxide is known for thousands of years you know zinc oxide chinese knew the uh you know paper making chinese paper making so they use the nanoparticles of zinc oxide they didn't know that they are nanoparticles but zinc oxide they used to prepare antifungal antimicrobial paper for making the documents and today it is being you know used popularly for printing the notes that makes it antimicrobial okay and also antifungus even you can make it uh, hydrophobic even if uh, by mistake if the note uh, you know currency note uh, falls into the water nothing happens and even if you keep in the moisture uh, you know place for many months or uh, you know years nothing should happen so these uh, these are possible and that is why i said functionalization is very important so you see gold is very expensive instead of uh, you know gold why don't you go for the zinc oxide nanoparticles which is known you know as non toxic and uh, also we have done a lot of work on its uh, cytotoxicity and so many other biocompatible or bioassays to prove that it is uh, uh, useful in the dentistry thank you so much sima can we present the study yeah i think uh, the participants so one last thing i think for kishore the biggest challenge for any polymer scientist is the uniform dispersion of the nanoparticles and to control uh, you know the functionalization uniformly all through and uh, the surface roughness uh, you know uh, these are the things which are to be optimized these are the challenging things of course it is you know uh, much better than what it used to be the, our knowledge in this area uh, still you know many uh, a lot more time is required to understand the chemistry of polymerization and uh, functionalization of the polymers to the required uh, application particularly in the medical application um, uh, everybody has lots of doubts still uh, sir has shared the email id uh so in any time any doubts please you can always uh, get back to him on his behalf i'm already uh, telling the participants that please feel free to uh, discuss if any doubts uh, the participants have um i'm one I second have... i would like to interrupt here one second uh, yeah. prashant kalappa has uh, noted that um, he has put it in the chat that uh, pmma polymerization is done using solution polymerization technique so the dispersion will not be difficult that's what he has put up in the chat yeah. <laughs> so many uh, participants had that dispersion uh, question right how it will disperse in the so he is telling that polymer uh, solution polymerization technique will be the method yes sir okay um i have no words to appreciate the endurance of the speakers you have been so kind so patient to answer so many questions Uh, i'm sure there are still many more doubts uh, for the participants they will be getting back to you i request all the participants to uh, please fill in the feedback forms we would be sharing the email ids of the speaker in case if you have any doubts uh, i now request uh, uh, sumu to kindly uh, one small token of appreciation on our behalf on the behalf of the special interest group dental materials we would want to present this certificate to professor kibairappa thank you sir thank uh, you thank you very much uh, for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity to share my research experience on uh, dental materials uh, 
and uh, also to exchange some ideas uh, with other experts in the field thank you yes, thank you sir uh, also to uh, dr kishore thanks a lot sir for sharing your vast experience with us i'm sure this time was not sufficient uh, we would be going on ahead with uh, more such collaborative uh, work and uh, also uh, upgrading uh, knowledge upgradation programs thanks a lot uh, sir for being today uh, of this part of this webinar Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sima. Ma'am. Thank you very much for providing the Thank platform you, to sir. share with you all. Thank you. It's Thank been you. a wonderful experience, and I we hope it became forward. And it was very nice to be with the Bhairava sir and other eminent uh, people in the field of uh, material science. Uh, and I hope we'll be able to do better uh, together. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Bhairava sir. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I once thank again you, thank our uh, chief guest, uh, Dr. Kushalapa sir, for being there throughout the session. Uh, now I'm extremely thankful to you, sir, for uh, enjoyed, being... enjoyed and learned. A... <laughs> so it's so motivating for us. You have been there throughout the session. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. That really uh, takes our webinar to a newer dimension. Thank you, sir. Uh, I once again thank the speakers, uh, Professor K. Bairappa and uh, uh, Dr. Kishore. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Ravindra sir for constantly supporting us thank and you. encouraging us for conducting uh, these kind of programs. Uh, thanks once again to Dr. Indira, uh, Dr. Sumuk. Uh, I think uh, with this we can uh, conclude the session. Uh, Ma'am, before we conclude, I would request all the panelists to turn on their video. I'll be taking a snapshot. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank you.